Matt Kruger, our local host from Denver. Thanks for having me. So Stan gave me the topic of uh, corneal ulcers and gave me the title of Secrets of Corneal Ulcers. And fortunately, there's been a lot of evidence-based treatments uh, in the past 10 years that takes it less as a secret to more evidence-based stuff so that instead of finding your own secret sauce, um, you can use some evidence-based data to treat your patients. Um, so we'll cover uh, bacterial keratitis, fungal, and viral. Uh, we'll start with bacterial. So this is obviously the most common thing that we'll see uh, in terms of keratitis. 30,000 cases per year in the U.S. Uh, based on data from a couple years ago. And the uh, in frequency continues to increase. As we know, the main contact uh, risk factor is contact lens wear. But we also see this with trauma, uh, ocular surgeries, and especially uh, with LASIK or other surface uh, surgeries. Then ocular surface disease uh, or dry eye um, and eyelid uh, conditions leading to exposure also put patients at risk, as well as immune suppression patients on um, steroids and other uh, more modern uh, immune suppression techniques. So the common causes, um, there's like hundreds of studies looking at this, and they all show varying amounts of gram positive versus gram negative. Um, but it seems to overall be about half and half. Uh, MRSA, staph, and strep being the most common with the gram positives. And the gram negatives uh, continue to be uh, pseudomonas, especially related to contacts. And serratia and proteus uh, were following uh, numbers two and three. So one question is, um, when do we culture and not to culture? I think in a lot of residencies, we're taught that we culture uh, pretty much everybody. Um, and that is not totally practical in today's um, modern practices that are busy. And there's also constraints. So typically, the uh, thought these days is that with small infiltrates uh, or peripheral, and there's no melting of tissue, um, there's no need to culture and just treat. But if it's a large infiltrate, uh, central in the cornea, and it has a stroma melt or significant alteration, um, ones that are chronic or atypical and site threatening would be reasonable to culture. So traditionally, culturing was done uh, onto plates. The problem with these plates is they have about a shelf life of six weeks in your refrigerator and constantly need, need to be renewed. And there are several of them, um, making it uh, just time consuming and difficult, uh, especially if you're not near a hospital. So uh, more recently, there's something called the eSwab. It's made by a company called Copan. I have no financial interest. But they actually uh, did a nice high quality study comparing this to traditional culture, looking at sensitivity and specificity. And it was basically the same. It's cost effective. It's not expensive. And it can sit on your shelf for up to 18 months. It's got a nylon tip, which is thought to help better than, say, a cotton tip in um, collecting and releasing the specimen. It just goes into a solution of amine solution. Uh, and it can be held for 48 hours before being sent off. And it's very nice that commercial laboratories that the patient can actually bring it to and just um, sign it out to them. Uh, LabCorp request will process that for you. And so it just makes it extremely simple. So uh, with respect to uh, antibiotics, what should you use? So there's probably been like 30 or 40 studies comparing fortified antibiotics and every variety of those with uh, all the different quinolones. And basically, every one of them showed equivalent outcomes with respect to vision or time to cure. And so overall, with um, these days, it's very reasonable to start a fourth generation quinolone. And typical treatment times would be uh, 5 to 14 days. So how do we know if things are getting better? Um, typically, when you see a patient back the next day when they present uh, 24 hours later, nothing will look different, and they may even look a touch worse. But I always check to see, is the pain decreasing? Because it seems like if they're going to get effective treatment, their pain is usually always significantly better from a scale of 9 to 10 down to 1, 2, or 3 uh, the next day. That always gives me confidence that we found the right treatment. Um, decreased discharge, and then with respect to the actual infiltrate itself, it will take two to three days to kind of see any improvement in the infiltrate, typically. Um, with the edge of it starting to demarcate and consolidate, there's be less um, inflammation around it. Usually you'll see white blood cells kind of in a halo around the infiltrate. Those will start to kind of condense down, less swelling and edema. And then many of these patients present with a you know, one, two, three plus cell or more and a hypopion sometimes. And that typically takes two to three days, but usually that will be going down uh, with effective treatment. And typically, these pe people present with an epithelial defect, um, but we typically won't see any kind of re-epithelialization for two to three days. Other treatments besides um, antibiotics would be the anticoagulinases, such as doxycycline. Uh, and this is commonly used by corneal specialists for severe ulcers. Unfortunately, there's no good data uh, or randomized control trials uh, showing uh, any difference in humans, but there is some in vitro studies and animal studies showing that it does help in certain ulcers uh, in rabbits. And so it's commonly used as overall, um, if it's a severe ulcer, it may have some benefit. And overall, the side effects of doxycycline are pretty low. 
So one question that's kind of been a, a serious question um, but it was, has not been answered officially was, what are the role of steroids? So I finished Cornea Fellowship in 2012, and these were universally not used during my fellowship, and uh, I think we were kind of steered away from using steroids. But the thought is they had many possible pros of decreasing inflammation, scarring, neovascularization, and stromal melt, all positive things. But the concern was, was would this worsen the infection, delay time to healing because of the immune suppression related to the steroids? So the good folks at uh, Sites in India, Dartmouth, and UCSF put together the SCUT trial. I think they looked through about 500 patients, or sorry, they looked through several, a uh, couple thousand patients. They had exclusion inc inclusion criteria that led to about 500 being uh, selected and to be randomized. And these were all culture positive uh, bacterial keratitis patients. So they all started initially on topical moxifloxacin of 0.5%. It was Vigamox in this trial. And then 48 hours later or more, the patients were put on either placebo or pred phosphate, and then the outcomes were measured at three months. So at three months, they found overall uh, in these 500 patients no difference in visual acuity, uh, scar size, or perforation. So while there was no overall benefit, there was definitely not any worsening of the infection, and so uh, we could definitely consider using steroids in some cases. So post hoc analysis of the subgroups did show that some patients fared better. And who were they? And they're actually the people who were the worst off at the beginning, the people that had counting fingers vision or worse to start, greater than four millimeter central ulcers and the deepest ulcers. More data shows that you know, nocardia was very common, especially in the Indian sites. Um, those people typically had larger scar sizes, uh, although their visual acuity at the end was the same. And in the pseudomonal patients, they were no better or no worse. So overall, the take-home results for the SCUT trial were that it's reasonable to use steroids in terms of the safety, as there was no safety concerns, uh, as long as they were non-nocardia ulcers. And they actually showed benefits in people that were large, deep, and with poor initial vision. And so I now routinely use steroids for people that meet these criteria. Uh, we do try and culture them if they are uh, a large ulcer, and so we should know if they're nocardia or not. And overall, it does seem to reduce inflammation and comfort uh, for the, or increase the comfort for the patients, and so the steroids seem pretty reasonable. Before we finish on the bacterial keratitis stuff, I just wanted to go over some special consideration. Always consider uh, anesthetic abuse that can look like a bacterial keratitis when they present. We have a decent number of patients that come in with uh, corneal abrasions that have received a bottle of tetracaine from the ER, and as it makes them feel comfortable, you know, we see this a couple times a year uh, with anesthetic abuse. And none of these things really apply to LASIK uh, or infectious keratitis after LASIK. Um, that way you would want to definitely uh, lift the flap and culture because you get a lot of atypicals and resistant bacteria such as uh, MRSA and mycobacteria. And typically they need to be treated with compounded uh, vancomycin or amikacin. Future directions. Um, so there's no good studies with corneal cross-linking uh, that are randomized control trials uh, showing uh, benefit but there are small studies from outside of the USA that do show benefits. And it's kind of compelling because it's one treatment. Uh, the patient would need less follow-up. It probably has a direct antimicrobial effect. Uh, and if you had a drug-resistant treatment uh, or a bug, this would treat that. And so it's definitely of interest. And I think that further studies will show this uh, possibly being a benefit. But we do not know yet. But that's something to uh, watch the liter for, literature for. So overall, the takeaways for treating bacterial keratitis are, you know, Consider just getting some kind of system like e-swab or transport media uh, that can be left on a shelf. Uh, that way you can culture serious infections without any serious inconvenience to yourself. Um, generally starting with some kind of fourth generation quinolones, bezofloxacin, gatafloxacin, moxifloxacin are the ones that we have available to us. And it's definitely reasonable to consider steroids uh, 48 hours after starting uh, based on the SCUT trial. But if there is concern for uh, high-risk uh, bugs like MRSA, compounded vancomycin generally in at least big cities is pretty easily available uh, for not terribly expensive, but generally is not covered by insurance. Next, we'll move on to fungal keratitis. So these people generally do worse than the bacterial keratitis, which generally responds pretty well to treatment. Um, up in Colorado, we don't see it up in a te more temperate climate, but it's in tropical climates, it's you know, extremely high down in Florida or places uh, towards the uh, Caribbean. Contact lens use is a definitely a strong uh, risk factor, especially for fusarium. And there's only one FDA-approved medication for this, and it's back in the 60s. So it's been 60 years or 50 years that we've, since we've had anything new for this. But nanomycin is not a great drug, and it uh, definitely has poor penetration. Uh, definitely does not penetrate the epithelium, and so often you have to de-epithelialize these patients to get good penetration. 
So I think people have been looking for alternatives to natamycin. Uh, topical amphotericin uh, can be used, but it has toxicity to the cornea, and it can't be obtained uh, except through compounding pharmacies, which can be difficult. Voriconazole is readily available, uh, as it's used in the hospitals all the time, and it's, studies have shown excellent ocular penetration, and it has great um, antimicrobial effects, is basically 100% susceptibility in common uh, fungal isolates. And so um, the MUT1 study set out to see what happens when we compare uh, natamycin to voriconazole, uh, because voriconazole became more and more popular in the uh, late 2000s, early 2010s, uh, because of the possible benefits and so this study just came out, uh, I think it was published in 2015, but basically it was stopped early because the people that were taking the voriconazole wound up with a much greater perforation and need for therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty uh, than the natamycin group did. And then at three months when they looked at the data, they found that the people that are natamycin saw better, um, especially in Fusarium, they were four lines better on the chart, which was significant. Other conclusions that uh, overall for Fusarium, uh, the scar size was smaller with natamycin and is about the same between uh, non-Fusarium ulcers. Um, when you re in the MUT trial, they cultured people uh, several days after starting therapy and people were more likely to be uh, fungal uh, culture positive in the boriconazole group. And then a, a year later, a smaller uh, group came out showing the similar thing. Uh, it was a smaller trial, but showed the exact same thing with higher uh, level of perforation and um, worse vision. So another thing people were using kind of off-label was oral, oral voriconazole, and this is the MUT2 study. So they compared oral, oral voriconazole with placebo, um, and then patients were taking either uh, voriconazole or natamycin uh, topically. The studies for the oral voriconazole showed no difference in the rate of perforation, uh, need for penetrating keratoplasty, or rate of reapplicization, but there were definitely more adverse uh, outcomes of voriconazole Voriconazole, there's definitely significant hepatitis involved with uh, oral voriconazole, and so that's always something you've got to look out for. In the post hoc subgroup analysis, they showed a possible benefit for fusarium ulcers. And so the takeaway from fungal keratitis is that we should be treating with natamycin and not voriconazole. We could consider oral voriconazole for fusarium infections that are culture positive for fusarium, but we have to watch out for hepatitis as that can uh, cause significant morbidity to the patients that we're treating. And oftentimes, we're not that qualified to be watching for hepatitis. So we'll finish up with uh, viral keratitis. And so the head study came out many years ago. And overall, there hasn't been anything too groundbreaking uh, with viral keratitis. Um, the treatment remains that you can either do it uh, topically or orally. I'd say the biggest transition the head study basically was done with all topical treatment with trifluridine. Uh, but I think most people nowadays are moving to oral treatments uh, because they are easier, require less dosing, don't have any toxicity. Uh, acyclovir is pretty cheap and um, with low side effects. So the treatments, if you're doing trifluoridine, it needs to be eight times a day, uh, it, but definitely have uh, ocular surface toxicity as a concern. Acyclovir is not commercially available. It, you can get it compounded um, topically for the U.S., but it's commonly used in Europe. And then in the last 10 years, gancyclovir has come out, and this uh, actually has wide good coverage, easy dosing because it's five times a day versus uh, eight or nine with trifluoridine, has less toxicity, but it can be a couple hundred dollars often for uh, the solution, and so it, it's difficult to um, get it for a lot of our patients. So if you're doing the oral treatment, um, acyclovir and valtrex or valcyclovir can be used. Typically the dose is lower for people with HSV treatment versus uh, uh, for zoster. Um, and then the suppression doses can be used at acyclovir 400 or uh, valtrex 500. So what we need to watch for with um, viral keratitis, there's actually some stuff coming out, studies. Uh, the Shingrix vaccine has come out. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of that, but that's been out for about a year now. This showed uh, much reduced rates of zoster reactivation and uh, is exciting compared to the previous vaccine. Although it has more side effects, but I, I look forward to getting this myself because I got a case of um, zoster on my back when I was 30. And so I, I also want to uh, not have this on my face sometimes, so I will definitely be getting this myself sometime. Um, there's also a study that'll come out next year uh, with gancyclovir for zoster keratitis. The previous ones were for um, herpes, uh, or herpes simplex. And then there's the Z study. So the previously we had the heads with, uh, for the simplex, and now the zoster Z study uh, will be coming out probably in 2021, which is looking at extended prophylaxis uh, with valcyclovir for um, VZV keratitis. Uh, so there are some things to look out for, but overall nothing too new uh, with the viral. That's all I had for you.
I do if, if, if it's a serious, I actually will, the hospital's not far from me, so I will actually take the patient and do all this stuff if I'm concerned. Uh, but it's, it's, you can actually get a gram stain off of the, uh, with certain people, uh, depends on who you're using for your culturing, but you can get a gram stain from the yeast swab. They can just take part of the solution, dry it out, and, and do that. So it is possible to do that. Well, basically, I was only had 20 minutes slot, so I did not do anything. Um, and it's, uh, the canth amoeba would be the, the obvious one. But basically, the studies were, I wanted to look at evidence-based studies. And there's not a whole lot, because it's more rare, uh, in terms of trials and stuff like that. So I wasn't, it's kind of outside of the scope of this talk, because there's, there's no real evidence of which ones to use uh, for, I say, a canth amoeba. So f either 50 or 100 milligrams BID would be common. Again, there's no good data on that, uh, comparing dosing and even if it's actually effective. But I generally do 100 milligrams BID for a couple weeks. Yeah, I, I, so I start usually like 70, I'm a little more conservative, so I generally start 72 hours in. And um, I, I, a lot of times, like I said, the patients are more comfortable. A lot of the redness goes away. Um, and the study seemed to show that there was no increased rate of perforation. So yes, without even without a total epithelial closure, I do use it. So it depends on who, who you're working with to actually do the culture. So your local hospital can process it. Uh, Quest and LabCorp don't, but it can, like in that study comparing the two, they they took all comers, so they they did viral. Uh, and fungal as well. So it, it can be done. It just depends on who your local uh, culturing uh, or the lab that you're working with, uh, if they'll take it or not. But there are definitely labs, in, especially in hospitals, that will take that and then plead it out onto the cyber rods and stuff like that. Uh, I had one other comment was um, I, I changed my dosing on the acyclovir uh, oral dose from 400 five times a day for the treatment to 800 three times a day. And it seems to be well tolerated and there's some uh, studies to show that's just as equivalent and then the suppressive dose 800 milligrams once a day so it's just a little easier on patients rather than taking a pill five times a day which is hard to so 800 TID or 800 once a day it's yeah. a lot yeah. it's a lot yeah. thanks Matt